anyway. It's good to be in Guelph. I get here a fair amount anymore, it seems. I've been to your chief, uh, your chief and council, your mayor and council. <laughs> I've been to your mayor and council a few times, and I've uh, been to your historical society a few times. So it's 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 uh, it's good to be here. So my job this afternoon is to explain a bit of the history of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Uh, I've entitled my talk. We're still here. Uh, that's getting kind of stale because I've been using it for I don't know how many years now, but really it, it's still kind of stale but truthful. People don't realize that we're the treaty holders for this part of Ontario. The only treaty holders recognized by the British Crown before that negotiated all these treaties and the Canadian government that came afterwards. Okay. The only treaty holders, no other nation at this end of Lake Ontario. So we're going to go through that and uh, explain some of that today. So you're going to get hit with a lot of history. And some of you might know, some of you might not know. And part of not knowing is my fault, because I was a teacher for all those years. And I didn't cover up the material either. You know, I was faced uh, way back when I started teaching 30 years ago. I was given a curriculum paper that said you have to cover indigenous history for all of Canada in two weeks and you better get it done. <laughs> you know, I could do it. Well, I thought I was doing it in those days. You know, you live by the document. And so I live by the document, but nowadays I'm not so so rushed. Anyway, as I get older I find the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. And so that is why I sit down during presentations anymore. I used to stand all the time until I fainted one time in front of the school. And then the doctor said to me, did you ever think about asking for a chair? And I said, no, I can't do that. You're being asked to go out there because stand up. Next time, ask for a chair. I took his advice. So now I don't live any longer in fear of fainting in front of there's about 300 kids there. Fortunately, as a teacher, I don't get embarrassed too often by anything. Not much anymore. So we're still here. You might have known us before as the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation. Up until, I guess, just before the pandemic, we were known as the Mississaugas of New Credit. And uh, someone said uh, at the time, what's this new in our name? There's nothing new about us. We've been around for hundreds of thousands of years, generations. So let's get rid of that new for very ancient people. Resonated with the chief and council, resonated with the band membership. So we struck out new, and now we're simply known as the Mississaugas of the Credit. And you'll, I'll explain later how we get the full name, Mississaugas of the Credit. Okay. So when you think about the Mississaugas, we're only in Ontario as a nation. You won't find us anywhere else in Canada, unlike other groups like the Enigma in. Uh, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, the Maritime area, uh, or the Cree found out in various uh, provinces, we are fairly limited to southern Ontario. And uh, really, if you've heard of the Chippewa people or the Ojibwe people, same group of people, just different names, we are a subgroup of the Chippewa, a subgroup of the Ojibwe people, and we got the name Mississaugas given to us by the settler government. But basically, we are the Ojibwe people living on the north shore of Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. There's a small little tiny First Nation left in Huron, but you'll, you'll figure that out a bit later. Uh, and so, that in our own language, we refer to ourselves as the Anishinaabe, meaning the human beings or people. So just think, Mississaugas, North Shore, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, you got it. You won't find us anywhere else. You find individuals here and there all over the place. But as nations, here. Now, we have, okay, come on, let me do, well, let me try this. Easy enough. We have our own migration story. Our migration story, it's oral history. It's not written down anywhere. One day I hope that uh, full-time historians will devote themselves to this. But this is our oral tradition that we started on the eastern seaboard. 
the Maritime Zera. And in response to an ancient prophecy that foretold the coming of the light-skinned race, we had to move if we were to survive. And so the Anishinaabe peoples took that to heart. And we migrated down the south shore of the St. Lawrence River and into the Great Lakes Basin. We were told to move to where the food grows on the water. And that was somewhere farther out west. The final end of the migration, or the end of the migration, I should say, took place <coughs> on Madeline Island, Wisconsin, western end of Lake Superior. That's where it ended for many of the Anishinaabe people. But for the Mississaugas of the credit, well, we didn't go, the, uh, the ancestors of the Mississaugas of the credit, we didn't make it the entire way. Many other groups left the migration part way. They found places that they liked for fishing, hunting, whatever, and they just left the migration. And that's the way it was with our people. We left the migration. We left the migration here. North Shore, Lake Huron, Georgian Bay, that area. Okay, matter of fact, with a map for that. Come on. Oh, there it is. And so that's where we are. There's still a tiny little First Nation up there today. But I start our map out here in 1634. The reason I started 1634 is that's when the French first encounter us. Okay, we thought we were going to escape in the light skinned race. Mm -hmm. Turns out they found us. And really, I don't even like the term found because you know what? We weren't lost. We knew where we were. But French explorer Jean Nicolette, 1634, encountered the Mississauga's north shore of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay. And wonderful thing, the French, when they arrived, they brought with them European trade goods. We love them. They made life easier for us. You're trying to try to knock down a tree with a stone lashed to a stick, see how you like it. Or if you want to, uh, you want to dress out a moose with a stone knife, you know, skin, skin the moose and then end up sewing with bone needles and so on. European trade goods make life a lot easier for us, okay? Make life a lot easier for us. And so the French bring those goods and we do engage in the transatlantic beaver pelt trade. Okay, now the thing is, so does everybody else on this map engage in the transatlantic fur trade. Okay, so in 1634, this was the lay of the land, more or less, in southwestern Ontario. Mississauga is in the north, and down below here, we're in Guelph, and I believe you mentioned the neutral people. Guelph was occupied by the Attawandaran people, or the neutrals whatever what you like to call Toronto, the Huron-Wendat area, farther to the uh, west, the tobacco people. That's all southern Ontario, uh, southwestern Ontario, and they're all trading with the French. All trading with the French. Okay? But there's one other group of people at this time, and they're living below Lake Ontario. They're known as the Haudenosaunee or the five nations they're often referred to back in those days. And nowadays you would be most familiar with her descendants as the six nations of the uh, Grand River. Okay, there's other Haudenosaunee groups in Ontario, but for our purposes, the ones closest to Guelph area, it's the six nations of the Grand. And so we're all involved in this fur trade. But the Haudenosaunee they're involved with the Dutch because it's the Dutch that believe they're in control of Lake, the south of Lake Ontario. Okay, but the Haudenosaunee have a problem. They have trapped their beavers almost to the point of extinction, not quite there yet, but they want to carry on with the fur, uh, the fur trade. They love those European trade goods just like the rest of us do. And so they have to cast a belt elsewhere. Where are we going to get more pelts? Well, move into southern Ontario. 1649, 1650, they move into southwestern Ontario and disperse those nations that you see there. The Wendat, the Attawandra, the Tobacco, they're all 
they're all moved out of southern Ontario. Matter of fact, the Wendat move uh, and end up at a place called Wendaki near Quebec. Some of them merge with the tobacco folks and become the Wyandotte of the United States. Uh, many of the neutral are uh, killed in the battles, uh, but many of them are also absorbed into the Six Nations or the uh, Five Nations Confederacy at the time. But the point of the matter is, all southwestern Ontario, about 1652 at the latest, maybe 53 becomes a beaver hunting ground for the Haudenosaunee. So that's why in your land acknowledgement, you acknowledge the traditional territory of the, uh, of the Attawandran and also of the Haudenosaunee. Okay, that's the way it looks. Now, that would have all been well and fine from a Mississauga perspective. We were kind of out of harm's way. But the Haudenosaunee kept pushing north. We're all fighting for control of this fur trade. Okay, major battles erupt and we fight, we fight a defensive war initially against them until finally we say enough is enough and ourselves and our allies, and our allies include the Dawa people, the Potawatomi people, other Ojibwe nations, we decide to uh, counterattack in the late 17th century. And you can see the path, of course, that we took down, okay? And we have, the Mississaugas have the first major battle with the Haudenosaunee and Aurelia, you know, Casino Rama area. Though maybe you don't want to admit that you went to Casino Rama. <laughs> we have our first major offensive battle with them there, and we handily defeat them there. And then the Mississaugas split off into two groups to pursue them. A larger group of Mississaugas head to the east, okay, and uh, chase them out of the eastern end of Lake Ontario. And those First Nations still are in existence out there today. You might have heard about the Mississaugas of Scugog, Hiawatha, Curve Lake, and Alderville. I think I got them all. They're still there. If you want to visit, go. My ancestors, what becomes the Mississaugas of the Credit, travel down the Humber River Caring Place Trail. And at the western end of Lake Ontario, that's where we drive them out. Last battle spot at Burlington Bay. Okay, matter of fact, just uh, more or less, you know how the, what's that bridge? Skyway. 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 Hmm. Either end of the Skyway, and as late as the uh, 1830s, there were signs of the fortification. At the, uh, at the time, okay. I don't know what's, I'm sure, pretty sure it's all concrete under nowadays. But there were signs of those, uh, those uh, battles. Okay, we, at the last major battle, we left two of the Haudenosaunee alive. These were brutal wars. Wars essentially of extermination. And it was said that they were, to, they were told not to return to southern Ontario that they would die if they returned to southern Ontario because this was now the land of the Anishinaabe peoples, including the Mississaugas. Anyway, the fur trade languishing a bit in this time of warfare. By the way, we know it as the time of the Beaver War. It languishes a bit. It's not very good for having the First Nations having to go at each other. Beaver pelts are not coming in. So the French broker a peace in 1701 in Montreal known as the Great Peace of Montreal, and peace is generally restored in the Great Lakes region. Not to mention, we still have a go at each one another every now and then, but it's not full-scale warfare like it was. So anyway, in 1701, peace comes, and this is the territory recognized uh, as the Mississaugas of the credit territory at the western end of Lake Ontario. And so here is the Rouge River. Travel west. You come to the headwaters of the Thames. Go southward, all the way down to Long Point on Lake Erie. And then follow the shoreline all the way around till you get to the Rouge. Again, that's about 4 million acres of land that we claim as our territory. And uh, many of you recognize the Greater Golden Horseshoe area. Greater Golden Horseshoe area. 
and uh, probably the most heavily populated, or most densely populated, certainly, and uh, industrialized region in all of Canada, and it's on our territory. Okay, it's on our territory. You'll see I've marked off a number of rivers. That's because we were always a water people. The Mississaugas of the credit. This is fall. This would be the time you'd find us uh, building, uh, putting our wigwams at the mouths of rivers and creeks. It's time to partake of the fishery again before winter. We usually, that's where we usually build our homes in the spring and fall. They're very portable homes. You'll see a picture of them later. But always at the mouths of rivers and creeks. And so you'll see all those major rivers marked, and you'll, and uh, that's where you find us. So you're suddenly transported back in time. Okay, so very relatively prosperous time for us: hunting, fishing, and gathering. We're not a people that build huge permanent villages. Okay, we just don't do that. Not unlike the Atawandaran people, the neutral people, that build palisaded longhouse villages, we have much more modest homes, portable, easy to move, going with the seasons. I just like to say seasonally migrant people. We're not farmers. We're poor excuse for farmers. I'll tell you that right now. We just didn't care. If it grew fine, it didn't find it. You know, we weren't concerned. So that's the size of our territory. One of these rivers is more important than all the rest, and that is number four. It's known as the Missanihi to us. You might know it as the Credit River. It, and we still send people out and do ceremony there to this very day. Okay, that's how important it is to us. Matter of fact, we just refinished our council house. And one of the first things our people did, we sent some of our band counselors out to pick out rocks from the Credit River, and they now inlay our council house table. Okay, so it's always that symbolic presence of the uh, of the credit. So anyway, no matter where we were on our four million acres of land, and we were usually spread out in small family groups in the winter hunting, trapping. No matter where we were, once it started to warm up in the spring, we would all converge on the Credit River. I like to say it was a family reunion of sorts. So we all gather at the Credit River, not just to partake of the spring fishery, but it was a time to engage in ceremony, a time to engage in trade, a time to talk over matters of uh, war and peace, a common concern. It was a place where we all converged and gathered. <clears throat> and like I said, we liked to trade. And the French, recognizing our fondness for trade, built a trading post there about 1722, we think. We think. I'm not exactly sure about the, I, I don't read French documentation, mm -hmm. so. 722. And, uh, well, Sometimes we would need a trade good outside of our regular trading schedule. Maybe winter, maybe fall. And so we would go to the trader and ask, uh, can we have that copper pot or can we have that gunpowder or skein of cloth, whatever it was. And, uh, and we'd be straight up and tell them, we don't have anything to pay with for it right now. We don't have the pelts right now. But he said, fine just to make sure you pay us when you get the next bale of furs. Bring the next bale of furs in. Springtime. So he extended credit to us. The Beat River becomes known as the Credit River, and we become known as the Mississaugas of the Credit. <coughs> That's how we get our name. And I am always fond of telling people, if Credit Karma was around uh, three, four hundred years, three hundred years ago, We'd have got one of the top scores, you know, what is it, 800 out of 900. You know, because if one of our band members could not pay the debt to the trader, another band member would come in and pay the debt. So we were always considered reliable that way. And so uh, I think the Imperial Historical Society paper said we were the good 
credit Indians as well. Now, I've used the term Indians, I've probably used it a few times. Don't you use it. It's not very politically correct nowadays. But as I tell uh, some of our band members, we talk about it. Most of us, we have no issue with it. Matter of fact, we all got cards in our wallet that says Certificate of Indian Status. And that's what we are. We're governed by the Indian Act. So anyway, be careful how you use it if you're going to try. Uh, anyway, so there's an upper reach of the, uh, one of the upper reaches of the credit. And on the, on the, on the right hand side, <coughs> pardon me, is a, an example of our wig ones. A highly romanticized picture. I, can, I assure you it's not anywhere near as neat as that. But I like the picture because it shows the portability, that they can just be moved, okay, at a moment's notice. Uh, I know from reading some of the first hand accounts of the French and so on that they weren't so neat, okay, weren't so neat. But nevertheless, it gets the idea of living close to water and that, and that portability. Like I said, this is the 1700s now. Relatively prosperous times. We got along with the French. We loved the French. They brought us trade goods. They intermarried with us. Uh, they learned our language. They gave us presents for using our, our for crossing our lands. And the interesting thing, and, and, and the great thing is, they never wanted our land. They never wanted our land. But all that's going to end when the British take over from the French. I'm sure you remember back to your grade school days, 1759, Battle of the Plains of Abraham. A few years later, the Treaty of Paris, 1763. New France is gone. England takes over French possessions. And, uh, well, now the British are the only game in town for us to trade with. Okay, and the British aren't quite so friendly as the French. Okay, not quite so friendly. And like I said, they have that insatiable desire for, uh, for uh, land. And so that's, we're going to go into another period of our history now. This is important for us, anyway, for our people, and that's the treaty-making period of our history. Okay. Now, a treaty is nothing difficult about a treaty, really. Maybe some of the language if you're trying to read one. But a treaty is simply a negotiated agreement between nations, and it's usually, notice I said between nations too, because that's what the British thought they were dealing with, individual nations. And it's usually, the deal is usually memorialized in some way. Back before the settlers came, we'd weave the terms of our treaty right into a wampum belt. Okay, like the one you see on the bottom uh, left-hand corner. But uh, once the British came, we had, to take, we had to get our treaties put down on paper, at least the British did, to remember all the terms. Okay, And so here's a typical, typical excerpt from a treaty. Map, crown signatories at the top, the British negotiators, and, and our chiefs down below. Okay, The chiefs sign their dotum, or the animal figure that represents their plan. Okay. And when the chief affixed his dotum or sketched his dotum on that piece of paper, that meant that not, not only he said the treaty was okayed, but it also meant the people in his clan underneath him gave assent. You see, we did everything by consensus. We'd talk and talk and talk and talk until we got an agreement. And once the agreement was reached, the chief would put his dotum down and that was the deal. By the way, this uh, this treaty here, what you see, piece of the treaty you see here, is for Burlington, downtown Burlington. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's called a Brant Tract Treaty. And like I said, you see the dotums. Uh, there's a couple of dotums open. Well, no, we got time. I think we got time. So that very first dotum at the top, Wabanis. Anybody want to wager a guess what it is? That very first door, right up, where to go? Right at the top. Right at the top. I heard something. Yes. No. It is a bird. Yeah, not a goose. Oh, that's the first thing I thought it was two years ago. It's an eagle. 
It's an eagle. You can tell it's an eagle by his claws and a beak. That's how you tell that's an eagle. Uh, okay, so you got that. So that Wabadis was an eagle from the eagle clan. Now the next one, that's the one who... Otter. That is an otter. You're looking down as the otter <coughs> swimming. If you're looking on a bridge down, that's the otter swimming. I thought it was a catfish the first time. I saw it. <laughs> it's very distinctly an otter. It's head up, it's tails back, and you've got the the feet going out on each side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember too. An otter can be also shown in profile on the ground. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so an otter can come a couple ways. Otter can come a couple ways. So anyway, typical treaty. Okay, typical treaty. Now the very first treaty we have with the British, and it's not for land, it's a treaty to establish peace, and friendship, and allyship on the land. That's for this, the Covenant Chain Wampum Belt. Okay. Uh, the British want to, the British recognize that we are both on the land. And it, the British government in the Royal Proclamation of 1763 had laid rules out for acquiring land from the First Nations. Okay, ordinary people couldn't buy land. An ordinary settler, one of you by yourselves, couldn't buy land. The British Crown would buy the land and then would distribute it to the settlers. That's the way it was going to work. It was hoped that they would prevent the First Nations people from being taken advantage of by uh, land speculators. That was the hope. And so the British laid out rules for acquiring land, and they also wanted to establish that peace and friendship out there. And so we met together at Niagara, and this came out of it. This belt was extended symbolic of that agreement. And so you can see the two, hum uh, two human figures, one on the left, one on the right. Uh, the one on the left represents the First Nations. There's 24 First Nations represented at Niagara, 2,000 First Nation leaders. And the one on the right is the British figure. And this is where I usually get the chance to ask, how do you tell the British figure from the First Nations figure? Well, we say because the British figure has a black heart. And we kind of laugh about that a little bit. That's fine. Uh, but really shows the way treaty making is going to go. Okay, treaty making is going to go for our people. By the way, the principles of the Royal Proclamation are symbolized in this belt are found in the Canadian Constitution mentioned in it even to this day. Okay, still in effect. Still in effect. Now, in the treaty making period, there's eight treaties that the Mississaugas of the Credit have with the British Crown and by extension the Canadian government. Only recognized treaty holders, like I said, at this end of Lake Ontario. Okay, eight treaties. You can see our territory, the large thick black line, and each color represents a different uh, treaty that we have with the Crown. Now, the thing that starts this treaty making off in earnest is the American Revolution. You remember the American, uh, the, uh, the British had 13 colonies along the eastern seaboard of the United States, started way back in the uh, early 1600s. And, you know, they've been in existence for a long time, each had its own legislature, its own form of government, still had to take orders from Britain, and let's face it, they grew up and they got tired of taking orders from King George III and the British Parliament, and they decided to go to throw off the yoke of the British. That happens in 1775. Now, a lot of people wanted to become American, separate country, fine, but there were many people that wanted to be, remain loyal to the George III and the British Parliament. We call them loyalists. Mm -hmm. But nasty things could happen to you if you were a loyalist in rebel territory. Tarred and feathered, rode out of town on rails, uh, thrown in jail, property confiscated, all kinds of nasty stuff. But if you could make your way northward into lands held, still held by the British, you would be rewarded for your loyalty. You'd get grants of land, you'd get new farm equipment, start life anew. And who has land but the First Nations? Okay, and remember, Royal Proclamation of 1763 laid out 
the rules by which the British would acquire land. They're not going to do it by military conquest. They're going to do it through negotiation. And so they do. The very first day, oh, I didn't get to show you this picture. Not that it's that exciting. Poor gentleman on the left is getting tarred and feathered. Okay? But great impetus to start the treaty making process. The very first treaty the Mississaugas of the Credit sign with the British Crown is for this strip of land along the western bank of uh, the Niagara River. Full length. It's a strip of land about four miles wide or six kilometers if you're the metric measurement, which I guess we should all be. There's a reason I had to go through metric in grade one when I was a kid. Here we are. You'll never, the British needed that land, one, as a safe passage around Niagara Falls, a safe way of getting around it. The other thing, they needed land to feed British troops fighting the revolution. This treaty is signed in 1781. The revolution is almost over, not quite, two years left to go. And this is what the British negotiate. You'll never guess what we got for that tract of land. You know those nice red, British red coats yeah. with the facings? That's what we got. 300 British coats. The man that negotiated the deal, the governor of the Indian Department at the time, was Sir Guy Johnson. I should say governor of the Northern Indian Department. Sir Guy Johnson bragged to his friends, I really didn't pay anything for that land. I was going to give them the red coats anyway for, for keeping them on our side in the Revolutionary War or in the conflict with the rebels. So he thought he was pulling a fast one on us, and I suppose he was. But what it also illustrated was that the British recognized that the Mississaugas of the credit were the stewards, occupants, and uh, land occupiers of this end of, of uh, Lake Ontario. And so more treaties would come, eight eight to be exact, and there's probably one or two left in the works. Now, this is where you folks in Guelph come in. Now you get excited, it has something to do with you. Number three, you're in our Treaty Three lands. The Treaty Three lands, called Between the Lakes Treaty. Okay, and this is you folks. Matter of fact, I'll just skip ahead a little bit. Well, that purple is our between the lakes, and you can see Guelph, Guelph there. Pardon me. Yeah, you can see the city of Guelph where it is. Okay. So between the lakes treaty, and this is negotiated in 1784, and it's negotiated for a very special set of loyalists. Remember those Haudenosaunee we drove out at the end of the Beaver Wars and said, "Don't come back, otherwise you're gonna, you know, you're gonna meet your demise." Well, they had fought for the British during the Revolution. They were allies of the British just like we were. However, when the American Revolution ended, the British treated them rather shabbily. They did not make provision for them when the war ended. And a lot of them lost their lands. And they were led by Joseph Brandt, Mohawk War Chief. Brandt was named after him. And he approached the governor of uh, Quebec, because this part of Canada was known as Quebec in those days, and reminded Governor Haldimand about their <coughs> loyalty to the crown during the conflict. And Haldimand agreed that they should be resettled somewhere. And so some Mohawks were settled out, uh, out further to the west, uh, just east of Belleville, yeah, east of Belleville area. But Joseph Brandt and his specific group of people expressed interest in land on the Grand River. And Haldimand agreed. But before he could grant that land to the Haudenosaunee, he had to go and put the land under treaty with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And so, in 1784, we're summoned to Niagara. We meet the governor. And we sign the Between the Lakes Treaty. And soon after, Joseph Brandt and the Haudenosaunee move into that strip of land that you see there, that black strip of land. It's known as the Haldeman Tract. 
uh, you might have heard of as the Haldeman deed lands and so on. Okay, and so that's what they were granted. And they move in there in October of that year. Okay. Now, controversy about that land, it's a deed, it's a grant, it is not a treaty. Okay. It is not a treaty, it is a grant of land. And so much in the news, well, not as much in the news as late, but remember a few years ago you had all issues of dealing with uh, land occupancy around Caledonia and the extent of the Haldeman Tract. So every now and then it crops up in the news if you're watching, and uh, the uh, Six Nations, of course, are uh, embroiled in a, in a, in a battle with the uh, federal government to get that all resolved. So, anyway, I won't touch on that. That's their business, not mine. So anyway, once again, here's Guelph. So you see, you're right. And just, uh, well, I don't know where exactly I'm. I get disoriented around here. Mm -hmm. So just not too far away, we have another major treaty, probably within five minutes drive, 10 minutes drive of Guelph. The Adjutant's Treaty of 18, uh, 18, but we'll get to that too. So some of these treaties I've talked about thus far are all early treaties. And I always say there was no meeting of the minds in those treaties. You know, no meeting of the minds whatsoever. First Nations don't have the concept of land ownership. We got it now, but back then we didn't have it. We might occupy land, we might steward land, we might even control it, but we don't own it. It's absurd when you think about it in some ways. How far down deep do you own the land? Five feet? Ten feet? Six inches? How far above do you own? In a way, it's a little bit absurd. Like I said, it's a gift from the Creator. That's what we use. It's ours. You start giving away gifts? I don't know. So we went into these early treaties. We thought we were sharing the land with the settlers. They would do their thing. We knew they were going to build villages and roads and establish farms. We weren't stupid. We knew that was going on. But by the same token, we knew that we would uh, be able to hunt, fish, and gather. We thought we knew we would be able to hunt, fish, and gather as always. There was room enough for everybody. And the treaties would be mutually beneficial agreements. Both sides would be benefited. Hmm. The British, on the other hand, thought they were getting outright purchasing the land outright. It was theirs. What's the term in real estate? Fee simple? It's theirs. You do what you want with it. As long as you don't break any bylaws, that's the way it is today. It's yours. You don't have to share it with anybody. There's no concept of sharing there. It's exclusive. It's yours. And it took us a while to realize we weren't sharing. We weren't sharing. We found out. It took us a while. So anyway, these treaties you can all find online. They're all there. And if you look at the treaties, uh, you'll see it's a land description. Go from point A to point B to point C to point D. Here's the boundaries. And here's what we're giving you. Now, for the land that you're on here in Guelph, the Mississaugas of the credit received a one-time payment of 1180 British pounds. One-time payment. Okay. So, and that's what you'll see reflected in the agreement if you look up the treaties online. They don't talk about treaty rights. They don't give treaty rights to us. They don't take them away from us, those early treaties. They're silent on treaty rights. So we talk about indigenous rights, if you will, inherent rights, but we aren't big on talking treaty rights, at least these early treaties. Okay, so uh, First Nations perspective, like I said, we're sharing, but we say those treaties do not take away our right to self-determination, our right to stewardship over the lands, the right to harvest, and the right to be sustained by our lands, water, and circumstances, uh, well, and water and resources, I should say. So that's what we tend to put forward in our arguments, that we still have the right 
to be sustained by our lands, waters, and resources there. So no real meeting of the minds way back in the late 18th century and early 19th century. And no better example in Toronto, whoops, no better example in Toronto. 1787, the British come to us in Toronto, in, in uh, the Credit River area, pardon me, get it mixed up, in uh, the Bay of Pointe area and ask for land around Toronto. We agree. That's 1787, the next year a surveyor is sent out. And the surveyor meets our people, comes upon them actually by chance, at the, uh, at the Etobicoke River. And we're there. What are you doing here at the Etobicoke River? Well, we made the deal last year that this was the eastern boundary of what we got last year. No, it's not. We said Don River. So disagreement there. Uh, the British thought they had acquired everything from the Etobicoke Creek, or Etobicoke River if you will, all the way over to Ashbridge's Bay. We thought they got the land between uh, the Humber and the Don, which is a much, much smaller parcel of land. And so we almost come to blows out there. Almost. Fortunately, calm heads prevail. Everything's okay. The surveyor goes away. We go our way. Nothing happens. Till about a, uh, a few years later, in 1892-93, the British decide they want to. They were uh, the 18, uh, 17, uh, 1792, 1793. The British decide they want to see what they acquired in this Toronto purchase. They dig out the deed and they find there's no land description on it. And they find out that the dotums of our chiefs have been glued on from another piece of paper. And so the British realize, uh-oh, we don't have clear title to the land. They violated their own royal proclamation. We got to renegotiate. And so finally in 1805, they renegotiated. And this time, this time, they get 250,000 acres of land, including Toronto Islands, that's what you're seeing on the left-hand side is the 1805 deal. And uh, you'll never guess what we get for that. More red coats. No, no red coats. Well, I think we smartened up a little bit by that time. Uh, we get uh, the equivalent of 60 Canadian dollars for 250, for 250,000 acres. And the interesting thing about that is Years later, in 1986, we said to the federal government, we said, listen, you took advantage of us back then, you took more land than you were supposed to, and you didn't live up to the honor of the crown, you didn't pay us what you were supposed to, the rightful payment, because there's rules and treaties that you have to be treat, treat First Nations honorably, and, you know, they didn't, and it finally was resolved in 2010. It was a result for the largest land claim in Canadian history at that time. At that time, $145 million. Okay, so it just goes to show you no meeting of the minds. And there's many of my people that say $145 million for Toronto? You agreed to that? Well, there was a cap on what the federal government would pay in those days to resolve a treaty. Right now, there's no cap, but back then there was. But when you think about $145 million, what's the average house go for nowadays? <laughs> anyway, you won't get into that. Uh, so we think everything's it's not going good. The treaties are disasters for our people. Treaties are disasters. We start the making treaty making process in 1781, and it goes all the way to 1820. We By the time we get to the first 10 years, so let's talk about, well, you saw the Brand Track Treaty there, that sketch. That's about 17, mid-1790s. Our population has dropped from 500 Mississaugas of the credit through that entire territory. Ten years later in the treaty-making process, we're down to 400. By the time we negotiate over Toronto the second time, 1805, we're down to 300. You can see where this is going. Okay, you see, our traditional economy collapses 
we thought we were sharing the land with the settlers. We would do our thing, they would do their thing, and we'd just mutually benefit from each other. Well, we find our traditional economy collapsed because we find our, our traditional paths fenced off. We're being driven off our uh, camping grounds, our traditional hunting grounds, and told to move. And there's such things as things like laws like trespass that we didn't know anything about. Trespass? What's that? We didn't know about the trespass when we walked through a farmer's field. And so finally, we wake up in 1806 when the Crown wants more land, and our chief, Quintipano, says to Colonel Claus, he's the Crown negotiator, Father, why are we so ill-treated? Whenever you asked for land before, we gave it to you cheerfully, and now you threaten to shoot us, you threaten to shoot our dogs. Father, why are we so ill-treated? But nevertheless, we are in no position to argue. Okay, because our population's dwindling, our traditional economy's collapsed. We're not going to fight anybody. We're not going to argue anybody with anybody. Okay, so very disastrous. So by the time we negotiate this treaty in 18, well, put it this way, now I'll say this. The War of 1812 intervenes. The War, and guess, guess whose side we fight on? We fight on the British side again. And we and the other First Nations help the British repulse the American invasions. Canada remains essentially a British country. And so we think we get a bit of a respite. We've proven ourselves as friends and allies. Here they come to us again, and they want more land. This is the adjutant's treaty. Colonel Claus come to us, comes to us in 1818. He's, and he says this right to us, I see your children are thin and miserable. Why don't you give the lands to your very great father and uh, you're not making use of it? And so we do. And in return, he promises, us, promises to clothe our women and children. He will give the band an annuity of 540 pounds, and I forget the amount of shillings it was. In perpetuity, you know the phrase, as long as the grass grows, as long as, the, you know, all that kind of mumble jumble. So he promises that, and so we could agree. Needless to say, I don't have to tell you, about 10 years later, our chiefs are complaining that we're getting shortchanged on the, uh, the deal. So that's the adjust tree, that's the neighboring treaty to go off. But we were careful. We were relatively careful. We kept our fisheries at 12 Mile Creek. Uh, you might know it better as Bronte Creek, I guess you might know it better as Bronte Creek, uh, 16 Mile Creek, and at the Credit River. We kept our fisheries there because we, we had to have something to sustain ourselves, okay? Because our population, like I said, traditionally complex diseases, we're riddled with disease. We've got everything going and no way to cure them. The settlers brought with us some nasty illnesses that don't mean much to us nowadays. Uh, you know, measles, uh, smallpox, small uh, flus, influenza. Nothing, nothing that we can't handle unless we think about COVID a little bit. Then we, you know, we're all in a bit of trouble then. But nothing nowadays that would worry us. Uh, anyway, so he comes to us in 1820. He basically says again to us, why don't you give the lands into the hands of your very great father and we will take care of them for you. We do because, as our chief said, Father, take the lands for we will not be around to enjoy them much longer. We thought we were on the verge of extinction. I suppose we were because there's only 200 of us now. The Crown thought we were on the verge of extinction. In return for those lands, the Crown promised to hold the land for us. If they sold land in their land or rented it to the farmers, they would use the proceeds to support the Mississaugas of the credit. So we put the lands in trust with the Crown. And so that was the end. Our treaty making process ends in 1820. And all we are left with is uh, 200 acres of land. That's it. 
Okay, matter of fact, uh, 200 acres, let me see if I can find it. There it is. Oh, not that one. Is for that red spot that you see there. And that was left for us in case we ever decided to move into a village. That was reserved us. So in the span of about 39 years, we went from 4 million acres of land to 200 acres of land, so barely an acre per person. Realistically, can anybody survive, survive on an acre of land? And so, yeah, and from 500 people to 200 people. Everybody thought we were going to be extinct. The Crown did, we did. We thought it was over. We disintegrate as a band. No longer Mississaugas of the credit. But one of our band members come to our rescue. Okay? And that's this man. That's this man, the Reverend Peter Jones. Actually, he's got a very interesting lineage. His father, well, his mother is Tuba Bananaque. She's a, she's a Mississauga of the Credit lady. And August, and his father, Augustus Jones. Anybody know familiar with Augustus Jones, the Ring of Bell to Jones folks? Baseline Road. Jones Baseline Road. Oh. He's the Deputy Provincial Surveyor. Now, Augustus is an interesting man. He has a wife and family elsewhere. But he's a surveyor out on the land. And he gets a little lonely. Okay? And uh, so he takes up a Mississauga wife. As one of our elders says, she was his bush wife. And uh, so he takes up a tube of banana quay whenever he's out doing his surveying thing. And he has two boys, an older boy, John, and this boy, Peter, he's born in 1802. And they're born right in the midst of this decline of Mississauga fortunes. Okay, Augustus isn't interested in raising these boys. He's got wife and family elsewhere. So he leaves them to be raised by Tuba Bananaque and the Mississaugas. And they grow up learning everything you need to know to be a good Mississauga boy. Hunting, fishing, gathering, such as it was at that time, because it wasn't very good. They know the ceremonies, they know the cultural norms and mores, they know all that. But about 1816, when Peter's about uh, 14 years old, Augustus must, must realize, like everybody else, that, hey, they're heading for extinction. I've got to save my boys from that fate. And so he moves them away from the Mississaugas of the Credit people and takes them to live with him near Stony Creek and later Paris, Ontario. Mm -hmm. And the boys get a set their edu education. Reading, writing, arithmetic, all that uh, kind of stuff. By the way, I won't even try and pronounce Peter's Ojibwe name. It means sacred feathers. And that's kind of interesting because his name eventually becomes the Reverend Peter Jones. Mm -hmm. So the boys learn settler education. The older boy becomes a surveyor like his dad. Peter becomes a brick maker, uh, but with hopes of going into the fur trade, such as it was at that time, which wasn't very good either. One day, he's about 21 years old, in 1823, he hears about a camp meeting in Ancaster, Ontario, just a religious revival meeting, and it's put on by the Methodists. You know them as the United Church people of today, okay? And he goes and he says he gets the good religion. He has a conversion experience there, and he becomes a very, very devout Methodist, and you can see his name, Reverend Peter Jones. He becomes devout. <coughs> And he decides the way to save his people from extinction, and he's not even a full-blown minister yet, is to give them a settler education. Well, first of all, convert them to Christianity, first thing. Second thing, second thing, give them settler education, reading, writing, arithmetic, and agriculture. In that way, he hopes that we'll be able to avert extinction. And he hopes even better that the settlers won't be able to take advantage of us ever again. And you know, by 1825, he succeeds beyond his wild streams. He's got all but two families converted to Christianity in 1825. And boy, we take to it. Well, we, we become devout. We're, and we're serious-minded Methodists. Okay. 
complete transformation of our lives, and we did so willingly. No one was holding a gun to our head saying, convert or die. We pivot. With the help of the government of Upper Canada, a year later, we move into a mission village on the Credit River. Uh, for those of you familiar with uh, Mississauga, uh, the site is the, it's the site of the Mississauga Golf and Country Club. That's where we live. That's where our village was. Okay, and so prime, prime entry, prime, prime real estate today. Make no mistake about that. And so we move into this mission village and completely transform our ways. We don't 100% give up our hunting, but we pretty much give up the rest. Uh, we move into this mission village, and those are two contemporary drawings of the village. Settler style log cabins, no more wigwams. We're moving into settler style log cabin homes. Okay. And we become full blown agriculturalists. And we're not talking about the Indian crops of corn, beans, and squash here. Forget that. We're into oats, wheat, barley, orchards. We're all into that. We quickly clear 900 acres of land. Okay, and you know who teaches us? The Reverend Edgerton Ryerson. Ryerson gets a lot of bad press nowadays. I just urge people, go do more research. Dig through the archival files. See what you can find. Our people, we gave them the name Chichok, which means bird on the wing. We liked him because he was everywhere amongst our people, helping us. He, this wasn't just on the pulpit, thou shalt not do this, or that, you know, pound the pulpit. We'd go actually work with, I love, love the one story. Somebody was driving into our village, you know, horse and buggy, and uh, they see, they said they saw him in his pantaloons out there clearing the land with the boys of the village. Okay, so we kind of liked him for that. The residential school system, whatever. I know for our dealings with him at the Credit River, we liked him. So we learned to farm. We learned all about animal husbandry. Before we only had one domestic animal. That was a dog. So we had the dog. And you know, pretty soon later, we're doing everything. Pigs, horses, cows. You know our first animal, domestic animal after the dog at the Credit River Mission was the lowly chicken. The chicken. Chief Crane's wife saw that the white ladies, the white settler ladies, raised chickens for meat and for eggs. And she wanted to emulate these women. So she began raising chickens. And so maybe instead of that ego, we should have a chicken. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that would be very good. But it wasn't a drunk. Who was it? Ben Franklin? Didn't Ben Franklin want a turkey as the emblem of the United States? I think that's what I heard. Ben Franklin wanted a turkey. But anyway. That's a whole other different aside. Uh, so Credit River Mission, change yourselves. We're, we believe in education. We're Christians now. How do you become a better Christian? You have to learn to read the Bible, right? So we promote literacy. And so the young children learn how to read. And they teach the older guys like me how to read and write. And so, great. Uh, Government, we change our government. No longer do we, we were the first constitution in Upper Canada. Okay, first constitution in Upper Canada. We have it, and we lay out rules for the village. Okay, no longer do we do things by consensus. We learn how to vote, and do one majority rules. So complete transformation. Uh, economics, of course, you know about the farming. Uh, well, what else do we know about? We built, we're the major shareholders of the Credit River Harbor Company. We build two piers out into Lake Ontario so that we can ship and receive goods. And eventually, we build our own scooter from our own funds that we raise. It's called the Credit Chief, and we use it to sail our own wood that we cut along, the, uh, along Lake Ontario. So complete transformation of our lives. Sawmill, grist mill, 
carpenter shops, shoemaker shops, or even right down to our dress. We dressed exactly like the settlers. People were amazed that we dressed uh, like that. People were amazed when they visited our homes because it just looked like we were settlers. Though it did cause one of our, well, one of my distant relatives, his name was William Herkimer, who's also a missionary, became a Mississauga missionary. He kind of accused us of becoming brown Englishmen. You know, but uh, but still, a bit of tense social tension is what what do we keep? What do we keep of the old ways? What do we adopt of the new ways? A bit of tension in the community, but it was eventually resolved. And uh, fortunately, we're still here today. Now, there's always one problem, though, for First Nations people, and that's a problem we have today. If you live on reserve. And this was a problem way back when the Credit River Mission villagers existed. We don't get title to our lands. Mm -hmm. We live on there because the government of Canada allows us to live there. As a matter of fact, you might have heard when you were younger, I don't hear about it too much anymore, about forced relocations of First Nations years ago. Mm -hmm. Don't hear as much nowadays. I'm sure it probably still does that. I know it does happen in disaster scenes now and then they mm -hmm. ask First Nations to move, but I don't know if just pushed on them like it was in the old days. But anyway, we didn't get title to our lands. We couldn't get title to our lands. We tried and asked uh, because we'd improved all this land. We'd cleared 900 acres of land. We'd got a hospital. We got a village with a hospital. We got businesses. We got all kinds. We'd done great. And now we want title to our lands like everybody else. And uh, we even sent our chief, the boy you saw, Peter Jones, over to see Queen Victoria. He visited her in, 18, uh, in 1837. He went over there in 1837, met her early on in 1838. And of course, uh, Queen Victoria seemed to give a scent that we should get treaty to, or we should get uh, title to our lands. But the sad fact was uh, the Prime Minister at the time left office, and you know how a constitutional monarchy works. It's only as good as the Prime Minister. When the Prime Minister goes, everything falls to pieces. And so we never did get title to our lands. And that was scared because we were scared because we knew the government could tell us to move at any time. Okay, and look at where the land is now. Prime real estate, downtown Mississauga. Okay, even then we were hedged in almost to, to the point of trespassing, where the settlers were coming in on our land and cutting down our trees. Okay, so we always lived in fear that the land was going to be taken from us. And so we started looking around to go elsewhere. We looked at Muncie Town near London, Ontario. Couldn't get a consensus to do that one. But, uh, and then we looked to Owen Sound. We were invi invited to go to Owen Sound by the Anishinaabe people up there. And we went up there, we took, set an exploratory team up there in uh, 1846, and we thought, we can't move here. <coughs> we spent all this time learning how to farm. We come up here and there's rocky ground, there's not enough water, we can't farm up here. And so we told the government, uh, we're not going to move, but the government said, you are moving. And so we had to look around for another place to go. Where are we going to go? You will never guess who came to our aid. Remember those Haudenosaunee people we said at the end of the Beaver Wars, get out and don't come back. Then a few years later in 1784, we negotiated the Between the Lakes, between the Lakes Treaty so that they could return. They remembered what we did for them at the end of the American Revolutionary War and wanted to return the favor. You see, as First Nations people, we're strong believers in reciprocity. Uh, what's the ter what's the phrase? Uh, one good turn deserves another, I suppose you could say. So we're supposed to be helpful, we're supposed to be helpful, mutually beneficial to each other. And so they recognized the aid we provided them, and they wanted to return the favor. So <clears throat> in 1847, they extended an invitation for for us to take up lands on the southernmost portion. Now let me just see. Of the reserve. Let me just go back. Do, 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 do. There. Yeah, that's it. So, so here's where the Six Nations Reserve is today. 
And that's more or less what they had then. So they heard about our plight and told us to take up land. And we took up the land in the southernmost portion of that reserve. And with the approval of the government, and the agreement of the Six Nations Chiefs, and the agreement of our people, uh, the new credit reserve was formed. And that's where I live today, just south of here, about an hour and 20 minutes. And uh, so we take, we've taken up land there, and we moved in 1847. About 250 of us now, so we've increased a little bit. Okay, we're, we're, we're still kind of small, but we're, we're not heading the way of the dinosaur yet. We're, we're carrying on. So about, uh, we move on 6,000 acres of land. 4,800 acres of land in Brant County, that's the larger square that you see, and another 1,200 acres in Haldeman County. And that's what the reserve consists of today. Our reserve extends right to the downtown of Hagersville. Okay, right to downtown of Hagersville. And uh, <coughs> like I said, we move in 1847, and boy, we learned some neat stuff. One of them is materialism. Before, <laughs> when we moved into uh, the Credit River Mission Village, we carried everything on our back. Everything. We move into New Credit, take some of our people two trips back and forth to bring everything with us. We got to bring the cows, we got to bring the pigs, we got to bring the kitchen furniture and whatever else was in our cabins. And so some of it takes two days. So like I said, we learned a little bit about materialism in the meantime too. But nevertheless, we settle in and begin farming. We never replicate what we have at the Credit River Mission. Never replicate it. There we were by the Credit River. Here we come to two small creeks that flow across our, our reserve. And you know what? They dry up in the summer. There's going to be no schooner. We did have a, we did have a uh, sawmill for a while, but it wasn't the most successful of things partly because of the drying up and things like that. But one thing we are good at is farming. And we still farm, and we were renowned in the area for the prizes we would win. Fall fair time, we just walked away with the prizes because we were good at it. Uh, when, uh, when we opened up our council house way back in 1882, 2,000 people came to visit our reserve and opened our council house, and that was kind of neat. And people remarked how well our, bar our barns were full of hay and all that because our animals were sleek and they were, we were really quite impressed with what our people pulled off at this new village. For starting all over again, we did quite well. But even the wheels start to fall off farming for us. We moved with about, like I said, 250 people, give or take. We got 6,000 acres of land, 1847. No, we like to have children. So you have a family, five, six kids, and that's kind of on the small side. What's going to happen? You've got to give them land, right? Mm -hmm. So the family farm has to shrink. Now let's give it another 20 years, another generation, 20, 25 years, 1690s, or pardon me, 1890s family farm has to shrink again. So that's a problem. Family farms can't support a family. There's also another problem. Uh, there's always improvements in agriculture. Always. New threshing machine, whatever. You need to keep up with things. Well, if you're a good settler, you've done relatively well with your farm, you need that new farm equipment, you can put your land, go to the farm, or put the farm uh, put the farm up at the bank for collateral, and you can purchase that, get a loan, purchase that new farm equipment. Remember what I said? We don't get land. We don't own our land. We can't put it up. So we fall behind in farming. We can't keep up. I know my own family history has people plowing the land like, you know, Pa Ingalls and Little House on the Prairie type stuff. And that's the early 1930s. Okay, so we were woefully far behind. The only thing that actually did make a difference in agriculture for us was World War I. We sent 11% of our population off to fight 
in the Great War. Four didn't come back, but the vast majority did, and they were able to get soldier settlement loans. And so then we could get some agricultural implements that helped us for a while. But really, what's happening, what happened at the turn of the last century, is still happening today. Uh, we have to move elsewhere. Okay, 6,000 acres of land can't support it. It isn't enough to support our people. Uh, it's agricultural land, but there's not much else going on there. Okay, and so then people moved to the nearby towns of, uh, well, Hagersville. If you're familiar with Hagersville, we have quarry mines out there, pit mines out there. Uh, the nearby towns of Brantford, Hamilton, go work in industry. That's at the turn of the last century. Uh, nowadays, uh, we have the same problem. Our population is fairly well educated, but they have to go elsewhere to keep body and soul together. You know, I taught school for I don't know how many years before I went to live on the reserve. But we have all kinds of people uh, that have that same issue today. Uh, one of our band members, his name is Dr. Malcolm King. He's a medical researcher, was head at uh, University of Saskatchewan, maybe still is, and with affiliated with the World Health Organization. Had to go elsewhere, practice medicine, and uh, practice and uh, do his medical research. Mary Maps, you've heard of Justice Harry LaForme of the Appellate Court of Ontario, uh, first Indigenous judge on the Appellate Court in Ontario. Had to go elsewhere to practice law. Uh, we even have a senator in Australia, of all things. He, his crap, his <coughs> trade is journalism. And he went to Australia to practice journalism. He ended up being the press officer, first an MP in uh, uh, Australia. And then when his boss retired, he went over and took over the, the seat. And uh, he just recently retired from the Australian Senate. His name is Walter Secord. So we're dispersed all over the place. Our reserve, like I said, there's 2,700 members of our First Nation, but only one third of us live on the reserve proper. The rest of us are dispersed elsewhere. Elsewhere. Anyway, <coughs> so here's some modern buildings at New Credit. Not too many people visit us at New Credit. Many people have never been to a First Nation before. So if you're driving through, come and take a look. We're, we're modern looking and we don't bite. Okay, because people are kind of afraid sometimes to go through the uh, reserve or whatever. Really. And so we're modern just like everybody else, modern buildings and so on. And we're involved in our projects throughout our, our treaty lands and territory. Uh, the department I work, work out of, the Department of Consultation and Accommodation, we meet with uh, proponents from about uh, 63 municipalities throughout uh, southern Ontario. Mm -hmm and big people that want to do big projects on our lands, and we, we meet with them and get involved in them, involved with them. Right now, we're involved in uh, the revitalization of Ontario Place. You've heard all about that. Uh, we're involved in that for a while. One of the ones I was uh, terribly excited with, you know, uh, still am in a way, but I know it's not gonna happen. I guess I was just wanting to see what was gonna come out of it, was Google, Sidewalk Labs is going to uh, Googleize part of the Toronto waterfront and make a, um, a showpiece for a city. You'd see what a computer controlled city would look like. They had heated sidewalks, they had awnings coming off of buildings. They knew exactly what was going in your apartment and so on. Mind you, that might have been part of the problem too. <laughs> People didn't like that their privacy would uh, be invaded. And uh, I think there was some thought too that I think maybe Google or Sidewalk, whoever it was, was asking for more land than the uh, First City of Toronto was uh, willing to uh, part with. So anyway, we were part of that as part of being treaty holders. It was thought wise that we be part of that uh, of that uh, process, and so we were for a time being. Like I said, I still have mixed feelings about it. I'd like to see what that would have looked like. That would have been exciting. But like everybody else, I don't want. To people knowing when I'm flushing my toilet and how much water I use and things like that. And that would have all been part of the uh, deal, I suspect. Anyway, so there's our treaty lands territory again. 
We still have some claims against the government, for example, the water claim. This, uh, we have, we, have uh, we claimed, uh, we put a claim for it in 2016 for unextinguished Aboriginal title of all the waters within our treaty lands and territory. There's only one treaty that specifically spoke to parting with water, and that was our, one of our, uh, the treaty for the Credit River area. The rest are, are fairly silent. And we even asked the British, oh, does, does this include the waters as well? No, no, we only want your land. Well, now here we are, 2016. Okay, we have title to our lands. We have unextinguished Aboriginal title to our lands. We submitted that to the government in 2016. And you know, here we are, geez, 2024, and they still haven't told us to go fly a kite. So that probably means they're thinking about it. <laughs> uh, there's probably some pretty big things to think about with that. But that's one of the claims we have about uh, with the government. Another claim we have with the government right now is, uh, remember those treaty 20, 22, uh, 23 lines where we put it in trust, and the government would look after it, and it would give us proceeds from the lands. Guess who didn't keep track of the proceeds? And guess who? Guess the, the, well, the man that was in charge of the proceeds way back in the 18th. There was no track of the, nobody kept track of the money. And so we approached the Crown probably, what, 2017, 2018 now. And you know what? We're in negotiations for that right now. The Crown readily admitted that they had not, uh, so now it's, uh, we're going to see what happens with that. So I wouldn't be shocked within the next year, you hear something. The other thing we have a treat that we're going for right now, and this is also in the works to be settled. Here we go. Oh, here we go. See this blank spot here? It's part of our territory. That's the Rouge Valley. Uh, where the Rouge Urban National Park is. Uh, some in Mississauga Nation signed off on that, and a few other nations did too, some of the Chippewa Nations, signed off on that piece of land way back in 19, well, 1923, and they just uh, called the Williams Trees. But we were not included in that deal, even though it was also part of our territory. And so now, that is also a claim, and we're also negotiating that. So we got a couple things being negotiated at the same time. So all these agreements are, uh, are you know, are hopefully will bear fruit in the next uh, year or two. We're patient people. We can wait a long time. We can wait a long time to get these settled. Anyway, so those are just some of the issues we have with the Crown nowadays. So always these talks. <clears throat> I always get asked about reconciliation at these talks, you know, what's reconciliation, what's reconciliation? I know there's 24 calls to action that came out in 2015 from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I still don't know what reconciliation is. I can whip out a dictionary and know what recon, you know, to bring back to the original, to restore whatever it once was. But our band has said, we don't really know what reconciliation is yet. And uh, we're kind of coming to a consensus, I suppose, for us is uh, hmm, the spirit of the treaties. The spirit, of, that's, at least that's the starting point. And we always use this two row wampum. I should, you know, it's two row wampum, you've probably heard about it before. Uh, it was originally uh, formulated by the Dutch in the Haudenosaunee way back in the 1600s. And it, the way you can think of it is a river, 1613, wonderful. Actually, I think it was a little later in 1613. I think it's 1630-something. But anyway, I'll take your word for it. Is it 13 or 31? I could be I'll, I'll take your word for it. I just know it's early 1600. Anyway, <laughs> one purple strip is a, a canoe, First Nations canoe. The other purple strip represents a settler ship. They're both going down the river in parallel which means they're not to interfere with each other. And a lot of Great Lakes tribes have adopted this wampum belt and said, that's the way we should deal with government. And I say, nonsense. Nonsense. We've interfered with a lot. 
with each other a lot in the last couple hundred years. So that doesn't hold. But I do like the white beads. I do like the white beads that separate the two purple. They represent peace, respect, and friendship. And I say that's where reconciliation is going to begin. If we can talk to each other in peace, respect, and friendship, then reconciliation will come about naturally, organically. Okay, but we got to get to know each other. If you're going to go down the same path, you're going to have to become friends and talk to each other in a certain way. And this is how you do it. Peace, respect, and friendship. I don't know about great big ideals out there. I don't think it's ever going to be forced on us by the government. It's going to be people at the bottom of the pyramid, people like me, you, getting together, coming to an understanding, and then moving things forward that way. That's what to me is reconciliation, uh, or the beginning of reconciliation. We still want to live up to our end of the treaties. We still want to live up. We said we were in, going in to share. We still see that. Okay, now, that's what we got to do. Let's restore the spirit of the treaties. We're, gonna, we're holding up our end, we're trying to hold up our end. What can you do? Ask yourselves. How can I be a good treaty partner in the 21st century? I see good things happening. I see your urban park. That's good stuff. I like to see things restored. Put the original, environmentally sound, wise. All in favor of that. Great. But how in other ways can you be a good treaty partner? That's what you have to ask yourself. If you're a school teacher, how can you be a treat, good treaty partner? What's that mean to you? I worked with uh, a health group a number of years ago formulating their land acknowledgement. I asked them, what would you incorporate in your land acknowledgement? How are you going to be a good treaty partner? And they had to sit around and think about that for a little bit. And you know what they finally came up with? We're going to promote the health and wellness of all people that live within our catchment area. And I said, that's good. You're being a good treaty partner. You're leaving the land and its people better than when you first came. That's what I look at. Are things better because of your existence? Are the lands better because of your existence? Are the people better because of your existence? That's reconciliation. Okay. It's a whole package. It's a whole package. Okay, you just can't separate little parts of it. It's a whole package. It's a whole ball of it. So anyway, I'm going to leave it there today. Oh, I don't know. Well, maybe I'll show you this one. This is my great great grandfather, or great grandfather. <laughs> His name is Joseph Sawyer. Joseph Sawyer. And the picture on the left, well, it was is at the Toronto Reference Library. And one day they brought it out of storage and they were cleaning it up. Cleaning it up. And they cleared all this, the top layer, so that's what it was. This is what they found underneath. A lot different, isn't it? He's kind of glum. He spanned the treaty making period. He was born in 17, uh, I think it was 1786. So he more or less spanned our treaty making period. And so our people go down almost to extinction and kind of get revitalized at new credit. He actually lived with us at new credit throw. And so he's seen the state of our people. He doesn't look terribly happy. He doesn't look terribly happy. I'm hoping through the reconciliation process, through the reconciliation process, that he would look more benign, like he does on the left hand side, than maybe we might might get him to crack a little bit of a smile, <laughs> or at least not look quite as glum, angry. That's what I'm hoping. That's a long process, folks, reconciliation. Go and read, go and understand, figure this out a little bit. We know a lot about you folks. I suspect you don't know a lot about us. Anyway, I'll leave it there. Do you have some time for questions? Oh, yeah.